Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for episode three of Hot Topics with Hot Rod. The pressure is on, or is it? I'm Erin Hollihan Haskell, president of HeatingHealth.com, and it is our pleasure to partner with Kalefi on this webinar series. Coming to us live from his workshop on Know It All Lane is our friend and industry expert, Hot Rod Roar of Kalefi North America. Thanks for teaching us tonight, Hot Rod. Well, thank you for hosting and uh, doing all the background work and getting the word out on this. And uh, uh, yeah, we love heating help. So I'll go we through a couple. We love you too. I'm going to ask Aaron to step in when we get to the a couple slides down here, but let me get started and we'll uh, we'll get right into it. So yeah, the typical housekeeping here, if you have issues with a connection or something like that, that's just how you can get a, a hold of the people at go to meeting, go to webinar. Um, usually, if it's a connection issue, if you just log out and log back in, sometimes that fixes it up. So um, all these, uh, we've done uh, about three of them now. They're archived already, and this one will be archived in a couple days. So if you missed an episode or if you want to uh, view it again or something like that, you can catch these at uh, both the heatinghelp.com uh, YouTube channel and also at the Cluffy YouTube channel. So I think we talked about that. So I've got one more coming up on August 24th, and uh, basically what I'm going to do on the next one is uh, I've just been listening, doing a lot of webinars, and learning a little bit about what's happening as these buildings that have been shut down for a period of time are now, well, eventually going to start to open. They're not all opening yet. So I was reminded of this. I was in Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago, and I stayed at a, um, I don't know, it was a Hampton or one of those, and ha half the building was actually roped off. The parking lot and half the building they had barricaded off that you couldn't even walk down the halls or anything. So those those rooms are just sitting there now with stagnant water, so to speak, in there. The chlorine or chloramine is probably exhausted by now. So um, I've been learning a lot about what we have to do for that and also for the ventilation system. So that's going to kind of be my focus of the next webinar, and I haven't quite put it together, but I might get some help on that one. So, All right, so... Uh, <clears throat> In the spirit of the, uh, our chairman, uh, Marco Cleffi over in Italy has donated generously to some of the cause of the COVID causes and some of the hospitals over there. So we're going to try and keep that theme going, probably not at the million dollar level like Marco did, but we're going to try and uh, raise some money with this tonight and uh, to help out a good uh, charity or a good cause here. So Aaron's going to explain that on the next slide, but uh, we're proud of our boss for being so generous to help out. And it sounds like Italy's kind of crossed over and things are opening up over there. People are back to work. So hopefully we get to that point sooner instead of later. So Aaron, you want to talk about the, the charity this? Uh... Sure. The charity tonight is St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And they're really leading the way that the world understands, treats, and defeats childhood cancer and other life-threatening diseases. Now, the majority of their funding comes from individual contributions, so please consider donating, and Kalefi and Heating Help have a match up to 500, and thank you so much for helping us support this great cause for kids tonight. Yeah, if you've known anybody that's uh, taken advantage of these benefits from St. Jude's, it's a wonderful program. We've known some people that have gone through that, and it's, uh, it's helped them out. It's changed their life, basically, so we thought we, we picked a good one here for for that, so at the end you'll get a survey, and if you want, you can um, <clears throat> you can donate, and we'll match it. So there wasn't an hydronics that speaks specifically to the topic that we're going to cover tonight: pressure. And I want to try and cover pressure in both hydronic systems as well as domestic water systems. So we're going to cover two different types of, uh, of regulators and two different ways that we regulate and why we use pressure and how we use pressure. So I'm just showing all the different hydronics issues. Pretty much every issue we talk about pressure in some form or another, whether it's an expansion tank, precharge, or when we talk about plumbing side stuff, we talk about uh, PRVs and how to adjust them, how to put them together, and stuff like that. So I've got a lot to cover, and uh, we had a little bit of a a lag there, but um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, pressure and why we use pressure and how we use pressure. In a closed loop system, and I, I call that a hydronic system, and that could be a heating system, it could be a chilled water system, it could be a solar thermal system. I guess steam would even be a, a hydronic system. If you think of, you know, we start out with water, we drive it through a phase change, turn it into steam, and at some point it comes back as water. So I guess that would be another uh, instance where we use pressure to move things around. And then we talk about the uh, the pressure that moves water through a domestic water piping system. So it's the pressure that actually makes the water come out of the faucet. It's a little different than a pumped uh, closed loop hydronic system. And then we're going to talk about pressure differential. And that is when we start up a circulator pump in a closed loop system, how it causes flow to move in the pipes by creating a pressure differential from the suction side to the outlet side. We'll talk about pressure drop, 
how that plays into it as we go through devices, as we go through piping, as we go through boilers and stuff like that, we lose some of that pressure that we've added to the system from the circulator. And then uh, we'll talk about how we uh, select the right pressure. So these are the two types of valves that we're going to talk about tonight. Of course, they happen to be Calafi, but there's a lot of brands out there that do the same thing that we do. Over here is what we call a combo package. It's got a uh, what is the number 1013 uh, testable RPZ type of backflow preventer and it's hooked up with our half inch autofill valve with a gauge on it. Uh, we're actually going to do a hopefully we're going to do a video of this actually performing and you'll see how this adjusts and how that regulates. And so that's a typical I mean a boiler fill valve, a feed valve, they're called different things but basically it just fills and maintains the pressure in a in a closed loop system, hydronic system. And this one over here, similar looking product, this is um, a pressure reducing valve for domestic water. Uh, this is one of our new valves, it's got union, it's got a connection on it, it's got an easily adjustable uh, setting uh, knob on the top of it. So we'll break those apart a little bit and talk about them more, but that's kind of the, the concept tonight of the two different products. So in a hydronic system, people say, okay, well how much pressure should I put in my boiler? I'm putting a new boiler in uh, next week for a, for a, let's call it an apartment building. Uh, it's 40 feet tall, it's four stories tall, how much pressure do I need to put in there? How do I determine that and how do I know if I have too much or not enough? So basically what the pressure is doing in the system, it's lifting the water up to the highest point in the system. So let's call that the top of our uppermost radiator, radiant manifold in this case here. I See I've got a little air vent on the top of that, so let's say that was mounted right at the top of this building. I need to put enough pressure in that um, mechanic room at the bottom floor down here to lift the water up to the top of the building. It's not the circulator pump's job to get the water up to this point, it's the pressure, the fill pressure that you put in there that causes the water to go up, 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 get up to the highest point in the system. So here's the, the formula for that. It's just under a half a pound of pressure, call it 0.433 is what it exactly is, to lift water up a foot. So if I took that 40 feet times 0.433, it would take 17.32 pounds to get the water up to that point. So the gauge at the bottom of my system here would have to read at least 17 pounds of pressure to assure that I had water up to the highest point. Now if I had 15 pounds of pressure on that system, and let's say this manifold is tied in right here somewhere, uh, I wouldn't have water up to the top of this manifold, and I wouldn't get the air out, I wouldn't get the water filled up in my loop. So that's really the key to it. Now some people will just round this 0.433 off to 0.5, so you can do the math in your head. So if I had 40 feet times 0.5 is what? 20, 20 PSI. A little bit more than the 17, but certainly a little bit more pressure isn't going to hurt you. But sometimes just to make it a little simple, if you don't have your calculator with you or something like that, just use 0.5 times the, uh, the highest point uh, in the system that you have to lift the water up to it. So that's called my static fill pressure. That's the pressure that you determine just by looking at the height of the building. You can, you know, you can measure that. You can guesstimate that by knowing how many floors are in the building. Assume eight to nine feet per floor or more if it's a, you know, building with tall uh, 10 foot ceilings or something like that. Now in addition to filling that column of water, I'd like to have a positive five pounds of pressure at the highest point in that system. That's going to do a couple things for me. Number one, it's going to, the more pressure I put on a fluid that has air in it, the smaller I squeeze those bubbles and it's easier to get those out of solution when they have to come out of this vent. I'd like to have a vent like this at the highest point in my system. This works in conjunction with my central air scrubber down by the boiler. This is called a high point. So the other thing that the 5 PSI does, so the way this type of float type of vent works is as the water comes in here and fills up, fills up, eventually it, air comes out and eventually this float floats up to the point where it shuts off this little Schrader valve, basically what's in there, a little needle type of valve in there. Well, in addition to the buoyancy of the float in that water, if I had a positive five pounds of pressure, that helps assure that I've got a good tight seal on this little um, o-ring on this little needle valve in here. So extra five pounds, if you do your math and just add five pounds to whatever that number, that 17 pounds that I had previously, or call it 20 pounds, so it's five, 25 pounds of pressure would assure that I'm filled up and that I've got a little bit of positive pressure up on my air vent. And while we're looking at this, a couple things I want you to notice about this air vent here. You can see the blue line, that's the water level in this air vent. And what you shouldn't do, what I don't want you to do, and I've done most of my career until I learned uh, how these vents, and this would be true of all the different brands, by the way. So basically what happens is this little air pocket stays in here. And the reason that we want that air pocket in there, if there's any dirt and debris in this water as you're filling, 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 coming up to here, sawdust, Teflon tape shards, 
whatever might be in that fluid there. If you take this cap off and you take your thumbnail or a little screwdriver or something like that or the point of your knife and you push that vent down in there to get this air out to make sure that you've got water up at the top of your building, what can happen is any dirt and debris that might be floating in that water immediately gets in this little valve and now it's dripping or streaming or spraying from day one and you think you've got a bad vent when in fact what happened is you just pulled a little dirt and debris uh, up into that stem and now you could on the cleft you unscrew this cap right here take this off take the float out and you can let this hinge fall down and you can actually get in there with a I don't know, q tip or a little uh, edge of a, a glove or a wiping rag or something like that and you can actually clean out that surface where that little uh, trader valve has to seat in there so if you do want to burp it, here's an idea. Just loosen it at the thread right here until water comes out here. If water comes out there, you probably got your water up high enough that the vent's going to uh, float up and shut off. So better to burp it out or to purge a little air out here than holding this little valve stem down and, and risk losing your little uh, air gap that's in there to protect the valve stem. So maybe that's something that uh, you learned here. All right, so we talked about the fill pressure. Let's say we put a uh, 12 pounds of pressure in a residential application, just a single story building. 12 pounds, you know, most of the pressure reducing valves that you get are preset at 12 pounds. A lot of the expansion tanks, when you look at the sticker on the side, will say pre-charged at 12 PSI. Uh, it's just a number that everybody in the industry thought, well, that may be the most common number. So don't trust that the expansion tank really has 12 pounds of pre-charge in it just because the sticker on that says it. I would certainly get a um, pressure gauge and check every expansion tank that you ever put into a system before you connect it into the system. Uh, you might have to let a little bit of air out. We've seen them overcharge. I've seen some come with five pounds of air pressure in it. So you've got to pre-charge this to whatever you decide that you're going to put in this fill pressure in this building. So 12 PSI here, pre-charge my tank put it in the system. I want to pump away from my expansion tank always, and that's going to be one of the demos that I'm going to show today why that's so important. So here's another pressure that I'm going to talk about, and this is called delta P, or pressure differential. So the way the circulator causes its fluid to move through this pipe right here, it creates a pressure differential. So I put electricity to this pump here. The electricity turns into mechanical energy, which spins the impeller, turns it into kinetic energy, which is the moving fluid. And so as soon as I uh, plug this in, if I had a gauge on the discharge side, that gauge is going to jump up. How much? Well, it depends on the size of the pump, depends on the circuit that you've got it connected to. You know, these little residential circulators, typically you're going to get somewhere 6 to 8 PSI pressure increase across that as we uh, plug that in and start up that circulator. So that's an indication that fluid is moving through the pipe. If you had a gauge there and you had a gauge on both sides, you can confirm that your circulator is, in fact, moving fluid. You could actually um, check how much fluid if you use the pump curve and you know what that pressure differential is. You could go to your pump curve and see... Uh, figure out exactly how many gallons per minute is going through that. So um, let's see. If, yeah, I got everything there. There is no such thing as head pressure, and I didn't know this. I've been saying head pressure all my life, too. But this is really kind of a, uh, technically speaking, if you really want to dig down that far, and then you could read this article that Siggy, Siggy had, I think, last year in this uh, little newsletter that comes out from the magazine. Um, head is the, um, the energy that the pump is imparting to the system. Pressure is really a measurement of that. So to say head pressure is like saying uh, uh, heat temperature. You wouldn't say what's the heat temperature in your room. You'd say what is the temperature. So um, I thought I'd throw that out there. If you want to read the article, it gets into the, the physics behind the, that there really is no such thing as head pressure. You've got head or you've got pressure. So, And here's why we need to add that head to a circuit. So. We just drew a little schematic of some piping components here. And so as we add up all these things in the circuit here, we add up a ball valve at, let's say, uh, you go to the uh, Bell & Gossett, or any of the people that have an online calculator, it'll tell you how many feet every one of these devices is worth. Typically, a full port ball valve is, you know, almost one, you know, foot of pipe. If you use an 80 port reduced one, it could be as much as five or seven feet of pipe. Uh, it'll tell you what a swing check is, the different type of valves, T's, elbows, and stuff like that are typically five feet. So really what I want to do is turn everything in this drawing into one number. And the number I would like to know is how many equivalent feet is in the circuit right here. Because then I could go to the chart of this pipe. Let's say it's three-quarter PEX tubing, and I'll go to Upanor, pick a brand. You can go to PPI website and say, okay, I've got 100 feet of pipe, and I want to move X amount of GPM through it. 
what's my pressure drop going to go through that? And then, of course, the circulator that I uh, select to go in the circuit has to overcome the pressure drop of all these functions, all the devices in that loop there. So we call this EL for equivalent length. That's the number that I'd like to turn all these devices into instead of saying, well, this is a couple feet here, there's a couple feet there, that's some PSI pressure drop. I want to get it all to one number, and I just want it in one number. So if I did the math on everything you see in this drawing right here, it would come out to 100, uh, just a little over 100 feet of equivalent length of piping. And now I can size my, uh, my circuit later to that that number I you know every presentation I do for any group that I ever get in front of that gives me opportunity to do a training I want to talk about the point of no pressure change because it's such a simple thing and yet every day I go on Instagram or I get a drawing sent to me and people are still putting their expansion tank on the discharge side of the circulator. There's just really no good reason to have it there. In fact, there's a lot of reasons why you don't want to have it there. So what I did is I took this old Bell and Gossett drawing from the 19 whatever, Dan, 1960s or something, when I think Gerald Carlson put this together first. And we kind of put it in color, and we put some numbers on it, and uh, put some uh, uh, different lines to try and explain a little bit. So basically, I'm going to fill this system up to a static fill pressure. And if I had a gauge on every corner of this loop, and they're all at the same level. Let's say this is a fin tube baseboard loop going around a single-story house. And if I put 10 pounds of pressure in this system, maybe I've got a, a fill valve here, a, a hose connection that I can put pressure into this thing. Every one of these gauges is going to read 10 PSI. They're all at the same level. They've all been filled, and they all have the same amount of pressure. So now I want to put a little circulator in there because I want to get fluid to move around through this loop here. I've got uh, heat emitters on this loop, so I've got to get my fluid going through there. So I'm going to go in my chart and uh, figure out the length of this thing, and I'm going to size my circulator. Let's call that a uh, let's call it a double seven because it's a green pump. And so what if I if I had gauges on these different parts of the system? So what's going to happen? There's going to be 10 pounds of pressure right here because that's the point of no pressure change. I can't change this pressure right here because I can't add water into there, can't subtract water out of there. No place to put it, no place to take it from. That's always going to be 10 pounds of pressure right there. Now notice I've got a little bit of a droop down to 9 psy when the circulator starts because let's say that's you know 12 inches of pipe. Even one inch of pipe has some pressure drop to it at a certain flow rate, so let's call it nine. Now notice, as soon as I fire this up, plug it in, it immediately jumps up to 18 PSI. So basically, I've added eight pounds of delta P, pressure differential that the circulator is imparted to this piping circuit. Now as I go racing around through the pipe, I come to the first elbow, I scrubbed a little bit of energy going down this length of pipe, and down to 17, and down to 15, and down to 13 as I go around fittings, as I go through pipe, as I go through radiators or fin tube, whatever it might be, I use up, I consume some of that head energy that I just imparted to that fluid by uh, spinning that circulator. I don't drop below 10 pounds of pressure. So the good news here is all the energy that this is adding to the system shows up as a positive pressure everywhere in the system. So if I've got an air vent somewhere out here, that's good. I want to make sure I don't pull a negative pressure on an air vent. You'll see in the demo I can actually suck air into an air vent. So this is why we want to pump away from the expansion tank. Now back in the day when we used little pumps that only develop a couple uh, PSI, like a uh, called a Bell and Gossett Series 100, you know, 1750 RPM had a you know, small diameter, wide impeller, didn't develop a lot of pressure differential. We got away with pumping in the expansion tanks in those days, but now every pump is a little bit higher head than what those Bell & Gossett 100s are. So, you know, if we're adding this much pressure differential, we want to make sure it shows up as a positive, and I'll show you why that is. Let's just take the same drawing and just change one thing. Let's move the expansion tank to the circulator. Now the circulator starts and says, well, wait a second. I can't change the pressure right there. The only thing I know how to do in life is make a pressure differential. I'm going to take my pressure differential from the suction side of my circulator. So I just put five pounds of static fill in this so I can show a little bit uh, more uh, negative pressure on this. So that circulator starts up and says, well, I'm going to take that pressure differential from the suction side. And you can see starting about halfway around this loop, I'm down to atmospheric conditions there. I've got a negative pressure in the system. I'm down to negative uh, uh, 3 PSI on the suction side of my circulator. That's not a good place for a circulator to run. It can cavitate there. If you get your temperature up high enough, you can actually flash the steam because I put a negative pressure on my uh, fluid. If it's water in there and I get up to, say, maybe 190, 195 degrees, I could actually flash the steam there because I'm below my vapor pressure of the fluid. So that's a simple fix. If you see a job like this and they're having air problems or having noise in the system, just take and disconnect this and move the, I can leave it there on the wallet. Maybe it's fastened to the wall or it's up in the rafters or something like that. 
leave the tank there, just move the connection here, put a cap on it there, and immediately you get all that pressure differential showing up as positive pressure over your system. And a lot of your problems can go away making that one simple correction to a system. It's just moving the point of pressure, uh, the point of no pressure change. So here's what I did is I made a little um, demo, and this hopefully is going to be a live demo. I'll explain it first, and I'll click on it and see hopefully this link will work a little bit better than the last one. So I made this little demo here, and I put an expansion tank in here, and I think I pre-charged the APSI and put it in there. And you can see I've connected the expansion tank into different places on the circuit. So there I've got two little circulators. I've got one connection there. I've got one between the two circulators, so I can show one pump pumping at it. And then I've got this connection, barely see it at the bottom here, both the circulators pumping at the point of no pressure change at my expansion tank. And as I start these two circulators up, I can watch the pressure gauge here and see what happens as these two circulators. So let's see if this is going to um, see if I can get this link to work. There it goes. Something's happening. All right, we'll watch this for a minute. All right, hot rod here. Speaking of pressure, what I want to show here is I've got a little demo and I've pressurized it to six psi. I precharged my expansion tank over there, the red tank. And I'm going to show you what happens when I pump away from the expansion tank by opening this valve, connect to the tank, and then we're going to go down and shut this valve, open the bottom valve that I pump at the expansion tank with these two little circulators here, and I'm going to bring your attention up to this gauge and show you what happens when we do that from one point to the other. down to a negative pressure so I've gone down about what minus two psi in fact if I put my hand on that air vent you'll feel air is being pulled into the system when I pull in a negative pressure so that's what happens when you pump at the point of no pressure change as opposed to away from it simple enough all right all right so here's my setup now I've got my pressure reducing valve here set at 70 psi I've got about 85 coming in here. I'll have to start up my booster pump to get up that high. Got this set at 70 pounds, and I'm going to start open the valve and start flowing it, and you're going to see the pressure drop off, and then I'm going to show what the GPM is. I'll probably drop it to about 45 PSI and see what... All right, sorry about that. So, yeah, I was hoping you could see that gauge a little bit closer, but again, it depends on the size of the pump you put in there and uh, how much negative pressure you can actually pull in the system. But, uh, yeah, you can take the cap off. There's a little air vent just out of the top of the screen there. You can put your finger over and you can actually hear uh, feel and hear the air getting pulled into the system. So the air purger was taken out quickly, but if you had a system where you didn't have a good air purger, eventually you're going to get air pulled in the system. You're going to have an air lock. You might stop circulation uh, completely if you get too much air in the system. So, again, just pumping away from the expansion tank uh, makes all those problems go away. I thought I'd just show the inside of what goes on inside of a fill valve right here. Basically, it's a pressure-reducing valve, just like you'd see on an air compressor, just like you'd see on a pressure-reducing uh, valve on a domestic water system. Uh, we put gauges on them. We've got a gauge option, I should say, on all of our autofill valves. This is nice to make sure that whatever you set this up here on the screw, that that's exactly what it's going. There is a dial up here that says the pressure, but this confirms that, in fact, uh, that's what you're getting. They don't always match. This one might say 12, and you might have 15 pounds here. So trust the gauge right here. This can also be used for troubleshooting. In the Cleffy valves, this is a shutoff valve, right? Well, you can see it right there, a shutoff valve. So if you screw this knob all the way uh, counterclockwise, you shut this valve off here, and now this can be used to uh, make sure that you don't want to leak in your system. So pressurize your system, shut this valve. If your gauge starts dropping off, don't leave that job. Don't walk away. Somewhere out in your system, you've got, uh, you've got a leak in your system. So it can be used for confirming your fill pressure. Uh, can be used for a troubleshooting device. Notice there's a check valve also in here. Now that doesn't pass as a, a legal backflow device, but there is a check valve in there, so um, it does give you a little extra protection from getting any fluid that you don't want backing up in your system with that little uh, new pearl check valve in there. So uh, five and a half gallons a minute will throw through uh, this valve. If I've got 30 pounds of pressure coming into this valve, this valve will flow at five and a half gallons a minute. It'll taper off as you get up to the set pressure. Let's say I set it at 12 pounds of pressure. As I get closer to that, that'll drop off. But that's, a, I think, we're higher than any other brand out there in the industry now. So this is, we call it a, a fast fill valve. There's no lever. There's no screw. There's nothing you have to do to make this fast fill. Right out of the box, you set the pressure you want at the top here, and this will uh, give you five and a half gallons a minute. Uh, or three-quarter will give you, I think, nine gallons a minute. So... 
a big strainer all the way around the outside of this here to protect any uh, debris from getting inside the, uh, the valve mechanisms inside the, the diaphragm there. All right, so here's the uh, classic of what do I do with a fill valve when I'm ready to leave that job? Do I turn it off or do I leave it on? Well, here's a couple of things that can happen. And I know people on this call have seen this happen where something lets go or, uh, you know, I forgot to solder a fitting and it holds for a day or two and finally blows apart when the flux gets washed out of it. And you might get a call like this where the, you've got a flood in somebody's house because the fill valve was left open and the pipe came apart or something happened and uh, now you've got a big mess. So. Um, I've seen sheetrock ceilings come down when fill valves are filling in a pipe or something's come apart. So that's a really good argument why you should never leave a valve on. Some of the manufacturers probably even say turn the valve off when you leave. Now the downside of that is think of a system where you filled it up and you've got uh, room temperature water. Let's say you put 55 degree water in that boiler and uh, you turned it on, you ran it for a little bit, you did your combustion analysis, you walked away from it. What's going to happen to that system if you leave that valve off is air is going to continue to come out of there and it's going to come out as the higher temperature in that boiler. So let's say you get to a domestic water call on that boiler and it, for an indirect and it goes up to 180 degrees, more air is going to come out of solution and your air vent, which you're going to have back at your boiler, is going to bleed that air out. You could get to a point where the pressure starts to drop in that system because there's no water coming back in there to fill it up that your boiler could go into lockout and now your boiler doesn't fire when it's supposed to because some of these little mod counts, not all of them, some of them have a pressure switch in them that if it drops, it's supposed to be a low uh, water protection device. If the pressure drops too low in that boiler, it's going to go into a lockout. So you could, uh, you know, have a system that doesn't have a leak and it might still have five, six, seven pounds of pressure, but it could go out uh, into a lockout. So now you got a no heat call. So I don't know. I don't know what the what the best option is. I had one idea. I said, well, what about you leave the job and you leave the valve open and you come back two days later and if all the air's out, if everything's running quiet, maybe that would be a good time to uh, shut it off and seal it off and uh, maybe. Uh, leave it off in that case, but I'd like to see the boiler at least get up to a high temperature to make sure I got all the micro bubbles, all the air cooked out of that system by going up to a high temperature before I shut that valve off so I can uh, replace any um, air that comes out of the system with water so my system keeps working properly. Now another option that you could do, this valve right here, let's say you filled the system up and you came back two days later and say, okay, um, I don't want to really shut it off. I'm afraid there might be a little bit of air. Let's say you've got 20,000 feet of radiant tubing in there and you're not convinced that all the air has come out of all those uh, loops in there. What you could do is you could shut this valve all the way, again, counterclockwise, turn it around, turn it around until you shut it off, and just crack it open like one turn. And what that's going to allow is just a little bit of water to go through there, maybe, I don't even think, a quarter of a gallon per minute, so that any air that comes out, you'll replace it with water, but you're not going to get five gallons a minute going through there. So if a pipe does come apart, maybe that's a lesser of two evils where you could still maintain a little pressure without uh, filling somebody's living room full of water um, with a high flow going through it. So I don't know. Uh, you guys are going to have to decide. It's a, uh, I've got one other option I'm going to show you that you could do, too. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. And here it is right there. So this, I don't know who gave me this idea. I think Mark Etherton was the first person that taught me about this, and he calls it a pig. And basically what I did here, and I've got a little demo I think is going to come, yeah, I'll demo come up here in a second, but let me exp uh, set the stage of what this is. So I've taken it, this is just a little well tank. It's actually a little uh, Amtrol tank that's sold under the, uh, I think the Dayton brand from Granger, you can see it's got a little legs on it, which are kind of nice. So pre-charge this, and I pumped uh, 70 pounds of pressure. So I put my uh, purge and fill cart right on here, open this valve, and put 70 pounds of pressure in there. Then I set my regulator down to 12 pounds of pressure right here. And so basically what I could do is I could take this to the job, and let's say I've got glycol in here, and it's a, let's call it a solar thermal system, because those typically don't have a fill valve on them. If they have glycol in them or a snow melt wouldn't have a fill valve in it, you might have a, a fill tank on larger jobs. But I could take some amount of fluid in this here and put it on a job and just hook a hose on it and just hook it up to even the boiler drain at the bottom of the system and just turn this to 12 PSI. So what it's going to do, it's just going to be a pressure maintainer for those first couple days, maybe the first week. And the nice thing about this, if something does come apart, a fitting blows apart, I've only got about four gallons of water water in here that I'm going to lose before uh, I go into lockout condition, hopefully with a low water cutoff or a pressure switch on the boiler if all the fluid starts to drain out of the system. But it's another option for people that don't want to put a fill tank, don't want to put a fill valve, and just want to put a little uh, a pressure maintainer on it. You could do it with a webstone valve right here. You can see you could fill in one, put a pressure gauge on the other so you know what your uh, tank pressure is, and of course uh, a gauge could go on here that you want to set your 12 PSI. So let's see if I can get this one to play here. 
a little demo on this. Here we go. All right. Well, two out of three, Mary. Hi, Hot Rod here. Let me show you this uh, portable fill system that I built. So basically what we have here is just a basic, it could be an expansion tank. This happens to be a little bit of a, a well pump tank, pressure tank for a small well. Then I put a cluffy fill and purge valve. You can see I got a pressure gauge and basically I've pumped about what 70 PSI of uh, fluid into this tank from my fill pump cart there. And then I put a cluffy auto fill valve. Nice about that, you've got a shut off valve on this. So I've got it shut off right now. And basically I'm gonna see about how much fluid I can get out of this. Typically this size tank, I can get about four gallons out of it. So I just open up my, my fill valve here. And you can see the fluid come out and you know we're gonna get about four gallons on that. So you can use this on systems where you don't have an auto fill. You don't have a fill tank on it. You just wanna make sure that you maintain pressure for a couple of days when it first starts up. Because we know air is gonna come out of systems. You know, that's what air vents do as the fluid warms up. So this is just something that you can uh, take from job to job. And uh, yeah, there you have it. So what I, um, where I first discovered that thing was on solar systems, because what'll happen on a solar system, again, you fill it at room temperature, uh, those collectors might go up to 180, 200 degrees on a hot sunny day. Uh, some of that air comes out of solution. Glycol gives up its air pretty tough. It takes a while to get the, all the air out of glycol, so uh, somehow, somewhere, you need to maintain the pressure in that. So that's what you could use that uh, that little pig system for for uh, maybe the first week until you get all the air out. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. How am I doing for time? I'll work good. And we're going to talk about domestic water pressure and what the uh, pressure does in the uh, a plumbing system in your house. So. Same concept here. Um, typically, the water mains out in the street are going to have a higher pressure. Well, I shouldn't say typically. Lots of times, the water pressure on the main is going to be higher than what you need or what you can use inside your house. I think the plumbing codes require um, at least 20 PSI going into a house and no more than 80 PSI. So if you've got 150, 200 pounds, in fact, I was in Asheville, Carolina, North Carolina here uh, months ago now, the pressure on the street on some of those at the bottom of some of those mountains up there was over 300 PSI. In fact, they use a special high pressure um, two-stage regulator on a lot of those homes out there. They have a, a, a two-stage that they take it from 300 pounds down to 150, then from 150 down to 60 PSI for the buildings. But I've never seen a city supply that kind of water pressure. And it's, again, because they just send it to the top of the mountain there and whatever it is at the bottom is what they get. Whatever reason, the city doesn't use a lot of step-down PRVs in the street out there. So obviously we can't uh, deal with that kind of pressure. Most of the plumbing fixtures that you buy will have a maximum pressure of 80 PSI, like a toilet fill valve. They don't want to see more than 80 PSI on that. So uh, we want to make sure that we're not putting 100 PSI in. So this is the most common way that we would regulate a domestic water system is just put a pressure reducing valve. Um, when you select or when you size one of these, the right way to size this, we'll go through the steps right here, is you don't want to necessarily size it by the pipe size. Just because there's a one inch water main coming into the house doesn't necessarily mean you need a one inch pressure reducing valve. The right way to size a valve, like any valve, really a balancing valve, a mixing valve, a um, a zone valve, you should really size it by the load or the flow rate that's going to go through this device. And what you would do is you could go to the manufacturer's website and you can select, uh, I'll show you that next on the top, um, how many gallons per minute that building requires. So let's say you've got a residence and with everything flowing in that building, it's uh, like eight gallons a minute or nine gallons a minute, 12 gallons, or whatever it might be. What you want to do is you want to look at this graph and you want to say, okay, at eight gallons a minute, what kind of pressure drop could I take through this device? Because what's going to happen is I start opening more and more loads or faucets over here. This regulator is going to start dropping off a little bit. If I had a set of 60 pounds and I've got eight gallons a minute going through it, it's going to drop off a little bit. And that's called fall off pressure. Most engineers will accept somewhere between a 10 and 15 PSI fall off pressure. They say, we don't want you to go down from 60 down to 20 PSI when every faucet in the building's running. People are going to complain about lack of pressure, lack of flow coming out of their shower head. So a common number, I don't think there's any uh, industry standard for that. It's going to be about 10 pounds of fall off pressure that we can accept on it. That could vary but say 70 pounds of pressure, I could maybe take a 20 pound fall of pressure, I could go all the way down to 50 and I probably wouldn't notice that as you know, not enough uh, flow out of my shower heads or something like that. But if I've got this set at 45 pounds of pressure, I certainly don't want to take a 20 pound uh, fall off pressure going through this and end up with 25 pound, that's going to be a noticeable pressure drop. So that's really the number that you should be using when you size a pressure reducing valve is the fall off pressure, not the pipe size of it. 
interesting about the Kalefi valve right here, the same thing, we put a, uh, a knob that you can just turn with your fingers. This is a pressure balance cartridge, so there's pressure on both sides of this diaphragm, so you don't have to put a wrench on this. To you're not against the spring uh, tension because the pressure that's coming in through this valve is actually working on the top of that diaphragm, so you can just put your finger on this and set the pressure that you want. Um, you can see we've got it set at 45 on the dial here. We do uh, offer this with a gauge so you can confirm that that is in fact what's going on through the valve here by using the, uh, the pressure gauge on it. This is also called, uh, also called a uh, incline pattern. Notice how we've got this kind of laying at a little bit of an angle here. And whenever you lay a valve at an angle like that and you put an incline, now when water comes through this, I don't have to make a right angle turn, go up through my diaphragm, right angle turn. You kind of get a little bit of an angle flow through it. So that's how we end up with a lower fall-off pressure than our competitors. We've got a friendlier flow path going through this device, just the way that we forge this with 45-degree turns coming out of it here and also coming out a little bit more than a 45 maybe there. Instead of making a right-angle turn, going across a diaphragm, making another right-angle turn here and coming out through our discharge port, that inclined version gives us a smoother uh, passageway in there. It gives us a little better flow rate. So here's what happens. Uh, I did another demo here. Hopefully we can get this one running. So basically what I did is I set this at 70 PSI, and what I did is I started opening um, the valve right here and flowing more and more, and I actually put a Cleppy quick setter so I can see how many gallons per minute is going through this valve, and I want the pressure drop as I get the flow rate going through this, and that can confirm my fall off. So again, if I start at 70 pounds of pressure, I don't want to drop obviously much more than 45 or 50 pounds of pressure, so that's what we're going to uh, um, show with this little test here. Let's see if I can get this one working. Here's my little demo right there. I just did it out in the yard here. All right, here we go. Thanks, Max. All right, so here's my setup. Now I've got my pressure reducing valve here set at 70 psi. I've got about 85 coming in here. I'll start up my booster pump to get up that high. Got this set at 70 pounds, and I'm going to start opening the valve and start flowing it, and you're going to see the pressure drop off, and then I'm going to show what the GPM is. I'll probably drop it to about 45 PSI and see what kind of flow rate. So that'll tell you what the fall-off pressure is as we start flowing through this valve. Get on first. There's a 70 pounds. Let's open this up a little bit. Start flowing out the valve. Get down to about, there's 45 PSI. You can see we just a touch under six gallons per minute. So six gallons per minute uh, gives us a, a pressure drop between the 70 PSI set pressure down to 45 PSI. That's your fall off pressure. All right, so here's my setup. Now I've got. No. All right. So here's the graph that comes with the uh, the cleffy valves. So basically, if you look down here, you can see the two things on here. There's your fall off pressure over here. You can see it goes from two to twenty of the pressure, and here's the uh, gallons per minute going through the valve. So let's I don't remember what I said eight or seven pound uh, GPM go on the flow setter there that and say okay I can take a seven psi drop and you go up there and you can see on a three quarter valve you can see my fall-off pressure is pretty much exactly what we were showing over there, the fall-off pressure at that flow rate going through the valve. And so what you could do is you could look at all these different size valves here, and if you knew how many gallons per minute flow you need through that building, you could just align that acceptable fall-off pressure on that. So, again, what you're going to find here on top on this graph right here, you can usually go down about one side of the valve and have less or the same amount of fall-off pressure. So use this chart to size your valves instead of just saying, okay, I got a one-inch coming a pipe cone in my house, I'm going to go down the, the wholesale and buy a one-inch pressure reducing valve that might not uh, be necessary. And that can really start to make a lot of sense when you start talking an inch and a half, inch and a quarter, two-inch pressure reducing valves. You're talking quite a bit of money there. That could be a big savings if you put an inch and a quarter on a job instead of a two-inch because it gave you the right amount of GPM with an acceptable fall-off pressure. So. Here's a typical way that we would do it. Um, we would come in through the uh, backflow device here, and we have a, typically a ball valve there on both sides of that, so we can isolate these for a service. And there's a single stage. So I'd like to take about a two to one pressure drop on that. We can go as high as three to one. Three to one, this valve can start to get a little bit noisy in here if you start flowing a lot through it. So uh, to be safe, say a two to one ratio. So you know, dropping the pressure from 150, say down to 75 is acceptable. I wouldn't want to take a 200 pound pressure drop, a pressure man, and try to get it 
quite a, a big step to make with a single stage. So what you'd want to do in that case, again, going back down to North Carolina there, where they had 300 PSI coming in the building, here's an example where if I had 200 pounds, I could take that 200 pounds on my first stage, take it down to 100 PSI, then use my second stage to go down to the 60 PSI. So I've got a two-stage regulator here. Uh, it's going to save a lot of wear on that regulator, trying to put that under a you know, high operating condition of three to one uh, step down on that, that's going to put a lot of stress on that diaphragm in there, and that valve isn't going to last as long as you you can break that up into two steps here. So um, this is typically how we're going to do it on a high pressure uh, incoming main application. Now, you might not know what your pressure is here, and we've got some jobs out there where they've got booster pumps on the water mains, and if there's a fire hydrant opening sometimes and those booster pumps kick in, you can see a job where typically had maybe 100, 150 pounds main pressure might jump up to 200 pounds. So what I'd like to do, and I'll show you here in a couple slides, is put a lazy hand pressure gauge on the inlet side of that piping to that building. In fact, there was a one of these on heating help recently where the guy said, my main pressure is going way up over 200 pounds pressure. How can that be? Well, yeah, something's going on with your water provider that uh, that you're getting that kind of pressure spike or that kind of pressure coming into it. So if you regularly see that kind of pressure spike in your um, water main and the city doesn't want or can't do anything about it, uh, it's better to put two stages in here, put a you know, first drop down to 100 pound and get this down to the pressure that you want in your building, take it in two steps. Now there's another thing that you can do with uh, valves, with any valve really, a mixing valve, a balancing valve, any like this in parallel. And why you might want to do this instead, if you had a job that you did require a two-inch pressure reducing valve, you could split that up with two valves. You could put a low, um, say a three-quarter valve here, maybe an inch and a quarter valve here. They're going to work together to give you the amount of flow rate you want. But this could end up being less money buying the two smaller size valves than buying one big valve. And you're going to have a bit better pressure regulation because with any valve, if you've got a low flow condition going through a large, let's call this a two-inch valve up here, and you're trying to move just a, a small uh, flow going through that valve, what's going to happen is you're not going to have a very accurate uh, pressure regulation because you've got a big spring in here. It's used to moving a lot of flow through it. So typically what we'll do is we'll put, um, call this a high-low or two-stage here, but they're in parallel instead of series like they're up here. And usually I'm going to set this one a, a little bit, uh, three to four pounds higher than the pressure on this. So let's say I want uh, 65 pounds of pressure. I'll set this one about four pounds. So this is going to do most of the work. And what's going to happen when this one can't keep up and the pressure starts dropping, now it automatically starts going through the bigger valve. So they take care of when they step in, when they stage in, by just setting them properly at a, about a four-pound uh, pressure differential between the two valves. So that's a way that, number one, you can make sure that you've got a good, accurate uh, pressure regulation at a very low flow, say a half a gallon a minute flow, a little lab sink. I don't want to put that through a two-inch valve necessarily to have good uh, resolution. I'm going to go through this valve if I've got on a hotel where maybe at the end of the day everybody's taking a shower. I need 70 gallons per minute. Now I've got the valves, uh, actually both of them are going to work maybe that, that combined flow of 70 gallons per minute. So if you come across those jobs, it's similar when you see a high-low mixing valve on a building where they've got a small mixing valve for small draws. They've got a larger uh, thermostatic mixing valve above it for the uh, a hotel for maybe a high flow condition. You can do the same thing with the PRVs. And again, you might save a little bit of money by buying a three quarter and an inch or inch and a quarter, opposed to buying a two inch valve. And the valve's going to like it a lot if you can put it in a better operating condition. We are in the process of looking at, we, right now, Cluffy doesn't have a 300 PSI rated valve. Uh, the valve's rated for that, but we don't have one that's an operating 300 PSI. But seeing that market down in uh, some of those mountains, that sounds like a common thing. As we talk to the wholesalers down there, they sell quite a few of those higher pressure valves. We um, we are in talk with Italy to give us a valve that we could start at, say, uh, 300, maybe a little higher than 300 PSI as a single stage, and then um, put the second valve to get it down to the actual pressure that you want in the building. Yeah, that was a bit of an eye and I went to three different wholesalers when I was down there. I said, is this true that you guys are seeing over 300 PSI on some of these water mains? And they said, yeah, that's the... Uh, that's what happens out here. So uh, anyways, a couple gauges here that I want to share with you. If you're going to keep a gauge in your truck and use it over and over again, it's worth spending some money and buying a nice gauge. I don't know if you the picture. These are a liquid-filled, a glycerin-filled gauge. The nice thing about that, number one, they're a stainless steel case, they're a sealed case, and the needle doesn't bounce around in your truck because it's actually in that liquid in here. So gauge lasts a lot longer if it's seeing a lot of bouncing around in your truck. Yeah, it's going to be a $50, $60, $80 dollar a gauge as opposed to maybe a $10 or $15 dollar gauge, but it's going to last a, a much longer uh, service life, especially in the rough applications or if you're spiking your gauges, trying to make sure. This is a way that you can read pressure in pretty much uh, 
uh, hydronic systems, any system really. This is just a Pete's plug. And so basically this is like a needle that you would inflate a uh, basketball or football with. Screw that onto a gauge. It's a quarter inch connection here. And this Pete's plug, you take the cap off and there's a little rubber flap in there. And you can just stick that in and take a pressure uh, reading if you don't want to leave the gauge on the job. Uh, you can take your nice gauge and just use it over and over by having a, a couple Pete's plugs. You might have one of those on both sides of a PRV that you can uh, you know, check the operating condition, your inlet pressure, see what it's regulating for if you don't want to uh, buy gauges and leave them on the job site. And this is what's called a sweep needle. I call it a lazy hand needle. You can buy a gauge that's got the second red hand, and this, this second red hand will follow along with the first one. So if you've got a job where you think you've got a pressure spike, and let's say it's typically running at 120 PSI, and uh, you're having problems with your pressure reducing valves, you could be getting spikes up somewhere in here, like again in North Carolina, you could be getting a high pressure spike. So this red needle is gonna go up to the highest point that this pressure goes on this gauge. So this one here, I've got just a, uh, a garden hose connection on it that I could screw it on, you know, hose bib anywhere in the system, uh, leave this gauge on the job for a couple of days and see, or a week or whatever, and see what kind of pressure spikes you're getting into that. Another thing that's nice to put on gauges is a, a gauge cock. This is actually a nice uh, full port ball valve. It's a male by female, as you can see right here. So where I would screw in a gauge, I would screw that little cock in and then screw my gauge in there. So now if I do want to take my gauge with me or if someday somebody has to uh, switch out a gauge, put a higher pressure gauge in it for some reason, uh, you've got a nice isolation valve. Just like you'd put on a circulator pump or anything else, it's nice to have an uh, isolation valve for what, three, four bucks. You can buy one of these little uh, quarter inch gauge uh, cocks to make it nice for the next guy that might have to service or replace that. So anything else, Aaron or Mary? If not, I'm going to call this one a, uh, a wrap, and thanks to everybody for supporting Cluffy and joining us tonight, and also for supporting uh, Heating Help. A lot of good people hang out there. We, we do a lot of good over there, I think, Aaron, for the, um, the world, really. People from all over tune in there and get their uh, questions answered, so that's kind of a fun place to be. Thank you, Hot Rod. Everybody have a great night. All right. Thanks, team. Thanks, Dan, Mary, Aaron. Yep, you're welcome. Have a good night. Have a good night.